thank you so much for, for this wonderful opportunity to uh, present my book. Uh, thank you all for being present. It's still early uh, here in California, it's just seven o'clock, but uh, wonderful to see you all. And thanks so much, Adrienne, for this uh, opportunity. So did that work? Um, maybe in the meantime, I, I can just briefly summarize the, the, the core idea of, of my book, right? What I tried to do is essentially present a different perspective on, on the history of Christianity among black communities um, in, in the Americas. Um, as you know, the traditional story is that Africans uh, brought to the Americas their indigenous African religions and then gradually became familiar with um, Christianity. In North America, it was predominantly a Protestant Christianity in Latin America, a Catholic Christianity. But nevertheless, the way in which members of the black community expressed their Christian faith was, was clearly different. And, and the question then is, why was it different? Traditional explanation, well, it was different because it mixed indigenous African elements with, with Christian um, elements. And, and essentially what I do in my book is I try to argue that this history is much more complex um, than that, and that we need to add a third element to the discussion. Um, I don't deny, of course, the importance of missionary work in the Americas. I don't deny the importance of indigenous African elements. But the point that I tried to make in my book is that in order to properly understand um, why the expression of Christian faith, either Protestant or Catholic among members of Black communities all over the Americas is different, we need to take into consideration that especially in the earliest decades of the transatlantic slave trade, a significant percentage of Africans already identified as Christian before their arrival. And those are the people I call in my book Afro-Atlantic Catholics in the sense that you know, their Catholicism started in Africa and then spread to um, the Americas. Um, I'll try now to, at the end, to set up uh, my PowerPoint. Um, let's see if this works this time. I, I made you already really close. Yep, I think this works fine. Good, so you should be able now to see uh, the PowerPoint. Let me go full screen here. As well, yeah, seems to work. Um, can you all still hear me? Can you hear me, Adria? Yes, we can hear you very well. Very good, very good. So I have two observations before I start the PowerPoint. And the first one is that um, you will see on the PowerPoint all my quotations in the original languages. Um, in my lecture, however, I will uh, read the English translations. Yeah? So if you don't know all these languages, don't worry. Uh, in my presentation, I will read the English uh, translation. And I also will show a few videos um, during the presentation, very short clips uh, from videos with sound. Um, so you can all stay muted uh, in Zoom but please make sure you have your sound on your computer, on your laptop, make sure you have your sound on so you can hear uh, the videos that I will share with you um, during my uh, presentation. And allow me then to start with a short video from uh, Brazil. Um, I'll start this presentation in Brazil. I start in the town of Ouro Preto, um, and what you will see is a very short session from a prayer session of the local confraternity uh, or Congo Society, Congado, as it is called in Brazil, uh, a prayer session in honor of Our Lady of the Rosary. Um, so why don't we start with this prayer session and then I will um, give some comments on uh, this session. Here we go. Oi na beira do mar, oi que nego 
Okay. Now, how are we, how are we to interpret uh, the scene we just saw? There was a time when the interpretation was simple. Um, according to, to Catholic Church authorities, the scene we just witnessed was scandalous. It was nothing but a surreptitious attempt to smuggle into the Catholic Church elements of African superstition. Now, strangely enough, scholars who in, in later decades studied Afro-Brazilian customs from a post-colonial, often also a neo-Marxist perspective, and who were very critical of the way the church had treated black communities and their African heritage, these scholars tended to present opinions about the scene we just witnessed that were in effect very similar. They too pretended to see here a form of deception in the sense that indigenous African elements were smuggled into a Catholic church. The only difference is that they sympathized with this and interpreted the deception as a form of resistance against an oppressive church and society. The good reasons, I think, to believe that both interpretations are wrong and that it is important to look at scenes of black Christian devotion with different eyes, not just in Brazil, but all over the Americas, including North America. And let me name to you two reasons why I believe that it is important we do so. And the first one is the religious identity of Maroon communities. In other words, um, villages uh, formed by enslaved Africans who managed to escape. Because if all enslaved Africans had perceived Christianity as a religion of oppression, one would assume that those who were able to escape immediately liberated themselves from all Christian elements and returned to exclusively indigenous African religious practices. There are, however, plenty of examples to be found of Maroon communities where this was not the case. And let me share with you an example. Um, let me share with you um, an example from 1581 from the Franciscan friar uh, Pedro de Aguado, um, who comments about the Maroon um, community in Latin America that included a man who was honored with the title of bishop, a man who baptized, catechized, and preached. He also performed ceremonies, which they called mass. And when celebrating mass, this bishop wore a shirt of a black lady, and on top of it, he had a carmine tunic. And he prepared a sort of altar located in a sanctuary on top of which they had placed a pitcher with wine and a large loaf of bread. The bishop then sang something in his language to which those in attendance responded, whereupon they all ate the bread and drank the wine. Now, while his bias makes it difficult to characterize this religion, Aguado's description seems to point more towards a form of Catholicism influenced by indigenous African practices than the opposite. What becomes clear in any case is that these runaways may have perceived the Catholic Church as oppressive, but not so the Catholic religion, or at least not all aspects of the Catholic religion. My second point is that it is also important to correct a misunderstanding regarding the Christianization of enslaved Africans um, before their arrival in the Americas. Namely that their only Christianization had been a quick baptism, often a mass baptism that had no meaning or importance to these Africans. And that in other words, the Christianization process only started for real in America itself. Now, while this may have been true for many, if not most Africans, there are good reasons to believe that it was not the case for all of them. There's plenty of evidence that a significant percentage of enslaved Africans, especially in the early phase of, of the transatlantic slave trade, who were taken to the Americas, 
already identified as Christian before their arrival. And, and you see that um, clearly if you read, for example, uh, Sandoval, um, who commenting, you know, 17th century Cartagena, Colombia, um, where he explained that a significant number of enslaved Africans identified as Christian and that some of them assisted him in uh, the preparation of baptism of so-called bozales. In other words, Africans who were not yet familiar with um, Christianity. And when you look at those who helped him, um, um, then um, the vast majority of them almost exclusively uh, originated from parts of Africa with a historically strong Portuguese influence. The Cape Verde Islands, uh, San Tome, uh, the region of Congo, uh, Angola, people who I decided to call in my book Afro-Atlantic Catholics. Now sources like Sandoval also allow us to correct a third recurrent misunderstanding with regard to the Christianization of Africans in the Americas, namely the assumption that white missionaries were the dominant agents. And this is not true. Um, in reality, black catechists played a major role in the Christianization of enslaved Africans, not just in Iberian colonies. Yeah, I, I can um, quote here an example from uh, French colonies. Um, I can make a reference to Guillaume Moreau. Um, and according to Moreau, they were not white missionaries, but, but rather black catechists who thought, um, who taught African newcomers the prayers, took them to church, to catechism, made them attend mass, made them observe the, the ceremonies, and then tried to persuade them to ask for baptism. And only at that point, at that stage, did white missionaries step in. And again, if you look at the background of these catechists, you will find that virtually all of them came from parts of Africa with a historically strong Portuguese presence. And this made me disagree. It made me disagree with some of what established scholars have written on the history of Black um, Christianity. And one such scholar is, is Albert Roboto, a scholar whom I deeply uh, admire. Um, but uh, when I read in his book um, that uh, the expansion of Christianity only took off when Christianized slaves began to return from Europe and America to Africa in the late 18th century, and that everything before that had very little um, success, um, then, then, then I have to disagree. Um, my research really led to different conclusions, namely that the Portuguese presence in Africa had a tremendous impact on the history of Christianity to the point that the development of Black Christianity in America cannot be understood without taking into consideration this impact. And, and before I get there, um, let me raise another question first. You know, why is it that intelligent people like Roboto and other scholars have underestimated the impact of Portuguese presence in Africa on the development of Christianity? A very important reason, I think, is that Portugal introduced Christianity in Africa in the late Middle Ages. So before the Council of Trent, where scholars have tended to look at traces of this influence from a post-Tridentine perspective, and therefore often concluded that what they saw had little or nothing to do with Christianity. Interestingly, this was even the case with Portuguese themselves. And, and let me illustrate this with an example from the island of Santiago. Uh, the largest of the Cape Verde Islands. And what I will share with you is a letter from the year 1762, um, a letter from the Portuguese administrator, João Vieira de Andrade, uh, with a list of concerns about what he called errors against the Catholic Church. Now, what were these errors that Andrade was so concerned about? Well, he says these errors were caused by mutual aid and burial societies on the islands. They were known in Cape Verde as reinados. In other words, they were known as kingdoms. 
And, and what would they do? Well, Andrade said, in all neighborhoods, women and men are elected to serve as kings and queens. And then every Sunday and holiday, they stage parades with their drums and flutes in order to collect money. Each year, they have a mass organized at their kingdom where they are crowned by the local priests and in their houses, they build an altar where they worship. These, and I quote, most ridiculous exercises, Andrade argued, were claimed to be Catholic, which he believed to be a lie, since these scandalous abuses, he argued, were in his opinion, undoubtedly heathenish customs. Now, what was Andrade criticizing here? He was essentially criticizing the very same phenomenon that we saw at the beginning of my presentation. What he was criticizing was an African reinvention of a late medieval tradition, that of the confraternity, an organization known for its veneration of a patron saint, for the tradition of making vows or promises to saints and for their dedication to the souls of deceased members. It is important to point out here that this is a tradition that has a black history on the Iberian Peninsula that goes back to the 15th century. Also important is to note that in the context of these fraternities, it was customary to elect people in leadership positions with aristocratic titles. Yeah? Here is a document from the year 1565 about such a black confraternity of Our Lady of the Rosary in Lisbon, informing about the election of a duke, a count, and a king. Now, the point here is that Andrade did not or did not want to recognize these Portuguese roots. Roots that, in the case of Cape Verde, went back to the late 15th century, when Santiago at its first church for the black community with its own confraternity dedicated to Our Lady of the Rosary. And it's important, again, to stress that there were two reasons why Aldrade failed to recognize these Portuguese roots. One is that what he saw was an Africanized version of this tradition. The second is that by the 18th century, the Catholic church in his native Portugal had changed considerably to the point that he perceived pre tridentine expressions of Catholic faith involving music and dance to be scandalous behavior. To a 15th century Portuguese, however, none of this would have been perceived as scandalous. Singing and dancing in honor of certain saints was in late medieval Portugal just as much an expression of Catholic faith as was fasting or praying. The rationale behind this can perhaps best be explained with reference to the African scholar, Felix Monteiro. Felix Monteiro from the Cape Verde Islands, according to whom denigrating comments such as those of Andrade reflect not only a form of disrespect, but also a lack of understanding of Cape Verde's Afro-Catholic heritage. He highlights, for instance, that the faithful in Santiago share a firm belief that saints hate sadness. Hence, the importance to express one's faith through dancing and joy, even during funerals. According to popular belief, Montero explains, saints consider sadness over someone's death a form of censorship to their superior decisions which if not handled appropriately can cause their anger. Hence the necessity to please the saints by regularly breaking the sadness during funerals with dance, laughter and joy. Let me illustrate this again with a short video because in fact, in some neighborhoods of Santiago, similar confraternities still exist today. Today, they're known as tabancas. And what you will see is an expression of, of Catholic devotion in the context of these tabancas. And what you will see is precisely this. What you will see is, is this combination of dance, music, joy, and prayer. Yeah? 
Um, so let me let me show you this um, short video from the Cape Verde uh, Islands. Amiga, boy family, tabang. Amiga raiz tabang. Tabang, se quer estar bem, tem onde quem está. Se quer na cal, já pode ir para levar na cal para morrer me. Tabang ganha, está ganha coração. Eu liguei a Catela São João, por isso que está infectado, porque ficou bonito. Tem que estar fazendo salva todo dia de tarde. So. What we saw here can be characterized as, as a typical Afro-Atlantic Catholic expression of faith with a combination of prayer and dance and music. Well, this expression of joy happens with African musical instruments, with African dances. It should be stressed that more is at play here than just a syncretic mixture of Catholicism with African elements, because after all, all religions are syncretic in nature. We need to be more precise because what we saw here is essentially an African interpretation and adaptation of a pre-Tridentine expression of Catholic faith based on a Portuguese model. And the place where this reinterpretation took place was precisely the confraternity. I can't stress enough the important role of confraternities in this process. Yeah. While it is well known that Portugal, in the context of its overseas expansion, contributed significantly to making Christianity into a global religion, the role of these lay organization in the, organizations in the dissemination of the religion in Asia, Africa, and the Americas has received surprisingly little scholarly attention. Yet, as the Portuguese historian Francisco Betancourt pointed out, the formation of confraternities was, and I quote, one of the principal processes of transferring European structures to other regions of the world. Yeah. This was the case, in fact, all over the world, uh, where you see Portuguese settlements, even in places where you would not expect this. Uh, for instance, uh, let me very briefly mention the case of, of Indonesia. Yeah. Um, and let me share with you the story of the um, Portuguese, um, of the Portuguese um, ambassador uh, Pinto de Frense. Pinto de Frense, who in the 1960s uh, was ambassador in Indonesia, um, where he visited uh, the island of Flores. And to his surprise, uh, he learned that on the island of Flores, uh, over 400 years after the Portuguese had left the region, uh, there were still some communities uh, where people identified themselves as Catholic, celebrated uh, Catholic holidays according to Portuguese tradition. Um, hello? Yeah, Hello? Hello? Oh. Hello, Mr. Let me let me mute him, please. Just Hello? Uh, I can mute him. Okay, that, that's fine. You okay? Okay. Can I can I continue? Yes, please. Okay. Please okay. mute yourself, please. Thank you very much. Go ahead, my friend. Okay. Okay. So let so let me briefly um, tell you the story of the Portuguese uh, ambassador Pinto de Frense, uh, when in the 1960s um, he became ambassador in Indonesia visited uh, the island of Flores and, and learned that over 400 years after the Portuguese had left uh, the region, uh, there were still some communities on that island who identified themselves as Catholic, um, celebrated Catholic holidays according to Portuguese traditions and even said their prayers uh, in Portuguese, despite the fact that they didn't understand Portuguese. Yeah? So they would essentially recite these prayers um, from memory. Um, and let me share with you a very short um, video from Indonesia and uh, from the island of, of, of Flores, where you precisely see this. Yeah, this is a scene from the Holy Week. You will see people praying 
And you will see that they pray in Portuguese, despite the fact that they don't speak and don't understand Portuguese any longer, yeah? but they still hold on to this um, tradition. So a very short uh, clip from Indonesia, from the island of, of Flores. So, uh, the Portuguese ambassador, Pinto de France, right? He tried to understand how is this possible, right? After all, for centuries, there had not been a, a Catholic priest uh, on, on the island. So how come then people would you know, keep doing these prayers and, and honoring these holidays, et cetera? And what's, what was essentially then um, his, his explanation? Well, his explanation is that people in Flores had essentially taken the organization of their congregation in their own hands without a priest. Yeah? And they had done so in the context of a confraternity. And essentially, we see the exact same phenomenon in parts of Africa with a historically strong Portuguese influence. Yeah? Uh, essentially, how, this, how, how do we explain this? A very important reason here is that the Portuguese had very few priests, yeah? uh, and that these priests essentially did not have uh, the means to control such vast territories and so many uh, communities all over the place. And essentially what we see happening is that they reach out to communities, they train locals. Uh, the typical thing for them to do is to train a sacristan and, and a schoolmaster, a mestre scholar, uh, the one who would you know, learn the prayers by heart. And then around this sacristan and mestre, um, they would build a confraternity. And in charge of this confraternity, you would have um, influential members of the local community, yeah? hence their names, Duke, Count, Queen, King, etc. Um, they did that not just on the Atlantic islands like Cape Verde or San Tomé. Uh, you see also these confraternities um, uh, and the importance of these confraternities in, in, in continental Africa. Uh, and here, of course, we have to mention the importance of the um, Congo um, Kingdom. Uh, the Congo Kingdom, as, as you all know, a, con a kingdom with, with a strong uh, Portuguese influence, a kingdom that, that auto-identified itself as, as Catholic, yet with a unique Congolese variant of, of Catholicism, as is reflected in, in the famous uh, crucifixes from Congo with, with the indigenous Nkisi on top. Um, now, we do know uh, that, that Mestris um, played a crucial role in the dissemination of Christianity in, in, in the region. And we also know about the importance of confraternities, right? Already in 1595, uh, we learn from uh, the Congolese ambassador in Lisbon about the existence of no fewer than six confraternities in, in Mbanza Congo. Um, we also know that these were highly prestigious organizations, right? Significantly, we know that those admitted as members to the confraternity could, in theory, not be sold into slavery. We also know of cases where leadership positions in the Congo region even required membership in a confraternity. Yeah? And again, these are very old societies. They're characterized by a pre tridentine understanding of Catholicism according to a Portuguese model. It would, it should as, as such uh, not surprise us that when uh, in the 17th century, um, we um, have um, Italian Capuchins uh, arriving um, in the region, uh, that these Italians encounter certain customs uh, that they as Italians, 17th century Italians were, were not familiar with. Yeah, and, and let me name with you, uh, let me name for you one example, uh, an example I have in, in French uh, translation, an example from uh, Dionigi Carli, uh, who during Lent 
uh, witnessed uh, the following, right? He witnessed how at night a group of people sang, but in, in a melancholic fashion that scared me, uh, uh, Carly writes, while carrying heavy logs of wood for penance. When he asked the reason for this, people answered him that it was done because it was a Friday in March, which surprised Carly, who then opened the doors to the church where they kneeled uh, during a quarter of an hour while singing in their language the Salve Regina with very sad voices. Now, what Carly witnessed here was very strange right, to this 17th century Italian priest, but it would have been very familiar to a 15th century Portuguese, because essentially what, what this scene is, this, this is a, a Congolese adaptation of, of an old tradition um, uh, to organize um, during Lent uh, nightly processions with penance and prayers for the souls in purgatory. It's called in Portuguese, the encomendação das almas. In other words, the recommendation of, of the souls. And again, it was a custom that typically was organized by confraternities. So the point I'm, I'm trying to make here is that it was in the context of such confraternities that an Africanization of pre tridentine Portuguese Catholic customs occurred, characterized by the expression of one's Christian faith through dance, music, song, community building, and the provision of mutual aid, both with regards to the living members, but also to the souls of those who had deceased. It may be concluded that it were confraternities, much more than churches, that allowed Christianity to become a genuinely African religion. It should, as such, not surprise that when we look at how descendants of enslaved Africans in the Americans expressed their faith as Christians, we come to understand the crucial role of confraternities. This is very obvious in, in the case of Latin America. Anyone working on the history of slave societies in Latin America will confirm the crucial importance of confraternity. Fascinating example here is, is the importance of, of these societies as described by Henry Coster um, in his early 19th century description of the yearly festival of Our Lady of the Rosary in Pernambuco, uh, Brazil, in the context of which the king of the Congo nation was chosen. Yeah. We even have, have a drawing of such a procession of a Congo Rosary uh, Brotherhood with, with, with the king um, in the middle, right? So here's the, this brotherhood and here the person with the crown um, is, is the king. Of, of this, of this, of this um, um, Congo society, this confraternity. Um, it is um, a tradition that in some parts of Brazil um, continues uh, up to the present day, right? Uh, here you see a picture of a contemporary uh, Congo king and, and, and queen, right? Uh, and, and when we see images uh, like this, right? It's important to realize that this is not carnival. Right? This is a very serious tradition and, and the people you see are people who have a lot of prestige in, in their communities. Yeah? Um, let me illustrate this uh, once again with a very short um, uh, video from such a Congo um, um, society parading um, in the streets. Um, So once again, right, you, see, you clearly see the prestige of, of this king. Actually, the sword fight uh, you saw at the beginning may, may even be understood in connection to Congolese uh, sangamentos. But, but important here is that it is in the context of these confraternities, right, that we see how ancient pre tridentine Portuguese traditions um, continue, um, such as, for instance, um, the tradition we spoke about a few minutes ago, namely uh, this encomendação das almas, this recommendation uh, of the souls in purgatory during the Holy Week, right? Um, so let me illustrate this. I'll show you a scene 
um, um, that shows how this, this tradition um, um, continues to live on in Brazil. Um, and it's essentially um, the same tradition um, that uh, we earlier saw a reference to in the case of, of Congo, right? So here's a short um, um, video um, about this um, recommending of the souls um, during the Holy Week um, in, in bioconfraternity um, in, in Brazil. Em alguns municípios do interior brasileiro, acontece durante as noites da Semana Santa um ritual folclórico religioso, denominado Encomendação das Almas. Esta tradição é muito antiga no Brasil e nos foi trazida pelos portugueses. Now, none of this is surprising, right? To scholars familiar with, with slave societies in formerly Iberian colonies in, in the Americas. Less well known, however, is that communities of Afro-Atlantic Catholics also thrived outside of Latin America, even in colonies ruled by Protestant nations, and that there too, we find references to the formation of mutual aid societies with very similar traditions to the confraternities we observed in the Cape Verde Islands and Brazil. The presence in Protestant colonies of enslaved Africans who identified as Catholics is, for instance, observed in the quotation you see here from the island of Barbados, uh, where we have a report by the Catholic priest Antoine Biet, uh, who went incognito in the mid 17th century to that island and found enslaved Africans from part of Africa with a historically strong Portuguese influence. Let me also share with you an interesting source from Jamaica. Um, the 1843 report from the Pap Baptist missionary, um, James Filippo, um, who explicitly confirmed with regard to the enslaved community that, and I quote, some of them were papist. And he then also mentioned um, the existence uh, on the island of, of uh, Afro-Christian communities that were organized in, in brotherhoods that celebrated their kings and queens with parades and paid great attention to the viaticum. Because when any of the fraternity were confined to their beds by sickness, the minister of father, Tata, um, as he was usually called, anointed him with oil. He added that these men professed a firm belief in purgatory, right? In purgatory. And that like Catholic priests, they pretended an acquaintance with the destinies of the deceased. Furthermore, Filippo explained that these fraternities organized Afro-Catholic missionary activities, among other enslaved Africans and that they did so in a clandestine way at night because they were technically not allowed to do missionary work themselves. Um, we find similar uh, information elsewhere in uh, the Caribbean. And uh, let me share with you a report from the Danish Virgin Islands, for instance, uh, a report by the uh, German um, a missionary worker from the Moravian church, uh, Christian Oldendorp, um, according to whom uh, it was common among blacks who came from Portuguese countries, particularly those from Congo, to perform a kind of baptism characterized by pouring water over the head of the baptized, placing some salt in his mouth and praying to God in the Congo language. Moreover, 
and he explained that certain Congolese provided a form of baptism to African newcomers. But before they could be baptized, these people had to receive five or six lashes from the baptizer as a punishment for the sins they had committed in Africa. Once the newcomer was admitted to the Afro-Catholic community, there was a Negro celebration and baptismal fathers and mothers would adopt those whom they have baptized as their children and look after them as best as they can, in particular when they pass away, because then they provide them with a coffin and bury your clothing. Yeah. So a clear reference to um, the existence of a form of confraternity um, in um, this community um, as well. So let me then um, use the final minutes of this presentation to move to North uh, America. Um, and when you look at, at 17th century documents uh, from North America, um, you realize um, that a large percentage, if not the vast majority of the earliest generations of enslaved Africans, there too came from parts of Africa with a historically strong Portuguese influence. Let me illustrate this with data from the enslaved community in, in Manhattan. Manhattan at the time when it was still a Dutch colony called a New Netherlands. Yeah? Here's a list of, of references um, to members of, of, of the enslaved community in Manhattan, 17th century. And when you look at their names, uh, you see that they all have an, an uh, Iberian Catholic baptismal name or what the Portuguese would call a nome de igreja. And, and when you look at their origin, you see that they're virtually all originated from the Iberian Peninsula, from Latin America or parts of Africa with a strong Portuguese influence. And, and, and who just likely um, were familiar at least to a certain degree with Iberian cultural and Portuguese and, and religious and traditions. Now, for the sake of time, however, I will not focus on, on uh, New York. Um, I will turn my attention further south um, to uh, the Carolinas and, and Georgia. And the region that once had the highest number of enslaved Africans in, in North America, uh, and where the vast majority um, um, of, of the earliest Africans originated from the region of Congo um, Angola. And in fact, memories of, of Central Africa uh, in that part of North America did not disappear uh, overnight. Yeah, the example I can share with you is, is, is a, an example of, of language. Yeah. Um, in the 1930s, uh, interviews were conducted with elderly Black people um, in the region, and, and they were essentially asked, do you still remember um, um, your parents or grandparents using certain African words or, or certain Gula words, uh, the, the term they used. And, and let, me, let me share with you uh, the answer that one of them uh, gave in, in the 1930s. Huh? Um, the answer was, yes, I do remember uh, some of these words. Yeah? And, and if you look at these words, yeah? um, um, Musungu, Mulafu, um, Gulu, um, then I think you will, you will agree with me that, that uh, these words are clearly derived um, um, from um, terms that originally um, uh, came from the Kikongo um, language. Yeah? And mind you, this is the 1930s, right? This is 100 years after the last enslaved Africans had arrived in, in the region. And still then, they remembered some Kikongo words. And, 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 and since this is the case, I think it's reasonable to assume that some religious elements of earlier generations may also have been passed on um, in these communities, including some Afro-Atlantic Catholic elements. And in fact, we find references to the presence of Afro-Atlantic Catholics in the region. We find references to it in, in the famous uh, Stono, rebellion from 1739, right, where, where John Thornton um, um, did important research and, and associated the, the uprising of the Africans in this region 
uh, and would have tried to reach Spanish Africa, uh, Spanish Florida. Uh, and why, why Spanish Florida? Because Catholics were made free upon arrival um, in a Spanish uh, territory, um, which may raise the question, were they actually Catholic or did they just pretend to be Catholic? Well, we have an anonymous source uh, from that time period and that source uh, does not leave much doubt, right? That source uh, identifies those who were trying to Florida as people from the kingdom of Angola in Africa, many of whom spoke Portuguese and profess the Roman Catholic religion. Yeah? Uh, we also have other evidence. Uh, we have um, the writings of, of Protestant missionaries, right? We have um, the interesting case from 1710, um, the case of the uh, Anglican missionary uh, Francis Le Jeu, uh, Le Jeu who, who learned um, during his campaign in South Carolina, 1710, that some among the enslaved population were born and baptized among the Portuguese and express a great desire to receive the Holy Communion among us. This prompted him to establish that these men would only be admitted to communion upon abjuring the errors of the Robish church, the chief of which is praying to the saints. Yeah. And this is not the traditional image we have of white Protestant missionary activity in North America. Right? The traditional assumption is that Africans had no idea about Christianity until they met with missionaries. But what we see here is that at least some considered themselves Catholics and, and even used to pray to Catholic saints. We also know that Protestant missionaries such as Ligio and others experienced resistance from what they called secret societies, you know, religious uh, African-American societies that were reluctant to embrace the Anglo-Saxon Protestant Christianity missionaries like Le Jeu were trying to impose. You know, uh, we have references to these, to these secret societies that, that white ministers knew about and, and worried about. Yeah? Um, and um, we also know that uh, during funerals, um, these societies would typically take to the street uh, and, 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 and they would um, have processions. And, and, and much has been written about the potential possible origin of these secret um, societies. And, and many scholars have argued that these must have been secret African societies in the context of which people celebrated indigenous African religious rituals. But what I suggest in my book is that at least some of these societies may actually have developed out of Afro-Atlantic Catholic confraternities. Yeah. Do we have any evidence to sustain that? Well, an example uh, that I quote here in this connection is, is a reference to the 19th century Methodist missionary uh, Thomas Turpin. Uh, Thomas Turpin, who uh, did missionary work in the same area, studied these secret societies and then um, explained that black communities in South Carolina had societies organized among themselves that appeared to be very much under the influence of Roman Catholic principles, right? Um, he reassured his, his Methodist readers, however, that he had managed uh, to impose a better principle of religion among him and that those societies were nearly broken up. And mind you, this is 1833, right? And still at that time, we have references to Afro-Catholic features rooted in fraternity traditions uh, in, in North America. We know that these societies were very important. And we know that it was in the context of these societies that Black Baptist and Methodist churches ultimately would um, develop, which then raises the question, why were Baptist and Methodist churches so successful? It's a difficult question to answer, but an important reason, I believe, is that of all missionaries, they were the only ones that gave local communities enough autonomy to organize their own churches. Yeah. 
In any case, um, these churches have traditionally been understood as a mixture of indigenous African elements with Anglo-Saxon Protestant elements brought to them by white missionaries. And, and the argument I'm trying to make is, is that, that um, it is worth considering a third source of influence to understand um, the development of these societies and, and the third source of, of influence I, 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 I hint at is, is fraternal practices rooted in ancient Afro-Atlantic Catholic Brotherhood traditions. Because in fact, if we look at the genesis of, of these churches from this perspective, several of, these, of their characteristics suddenly become clearer. Yeah? For instance, uh, the strong commitment in these churches to mutual aid, the tradition of gospel music, the tradition to call each other brother and sister. Yeah? These are all traditions that very much recall ancient confraternity customs. Let me also point you um, or point to the studies of John Gigi, um, who argued that, that African American um, um, Baptist and Methodist churches, um, they share uh, an interesting characteristic, um, Gigi writes. And what is it, this characteristic? Well, the characteristic is that they appropriated many uh, resources and rituals of black fraternal um, culture. Yeah? And, and my theory is that, that there is a reason for that. Um, and, and, and that reason is, is the early roots of black Christianity right? brought to America by Afro-Atlantic Catholics, which requires us to look at, at, at uh, the history of African American Christian identity um, from a different uh, perspective. And, and maybe if I may, I see it's, it's um, um, eight o'clock here, which I think is 11 o'clock on the East Coast, but maybe just five more minutes um, just to, to finish uh, the presentation with, with, with just an example right? um, to illustrate um, how my theory uh, encourages us to look at, at the history of, 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 of African-American Christianity with different eyes. And, and the example I chose um, to illustrate this is, is an example with reference to the importance of church bells. Um, in, in the 1880s, the American journalist Clarence Deming traveled through the Mississippi Delta and he was very interested in African-American Baptist and Methodist churches. And, and one characteristic surprised him, namely how eager church members were to have their own church bell. They often didn't have the money for it. They couldn't afford a bell. So they looked for all kinds of alternatives, but, but they really wanted their churches to have a bell. And, and one can wonder why, yeah? And, 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 and perhaps the traditional explanation here would be, well, you know, white Christian churches had a bell, so, you know, they wanted their own churches also to have a bell. And, and, and perhaps scholars who have interpreted the genesis of Black Methodist and Baptist churches from, from, from a, an, an African perspective, they probably would be inclined to explain this desire with reference to the importance of the bell in indigenous African societies, right, such as the importance in Congolese culture of, of the double bell or, or the lunga. Um, and although we will never know what, 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 where this interest in a church bell came from, my, my theory suggests the importance of, of a third perspective, right? One that makes a connection to the old African history of, of Catholicism, because we know that church bells already arrived in Congo in the 15th century as a gift from, from the Portuguese King João II um, to the churches in, in Banza Congo. Um, these bells, we also know, acquired such a strong symbolic importance that Banza Congo, and by extension the kingdom itself, became even known as, as Congo de Ngunga, right? Congo of the bell. We also know that this ancient name was passed on for generations, right, to the point that the Alliance of Bakongo resistance movement in the then still Belgian Congo of Congo would call its periodical Congo de Angunga. Interestingly, also data from Cuba reveals that the recollection 
of this history was passed on to later generations of Congolese in the American diaspora. Because when interviewing people in the early 20th century, the Cuban anthropologist Fernando Ortiz was told by an older black man that the Congo reales are Congos who in Africa are called Angunga because in their city, they used to have a church bell in Angunga. So this awareness of, of church bells and the importance of it to the Congolese community was also passed on among um, um, in the diaspora and was still remembered by some people in Cuba as late as in the 20th century. And, and this recollection of, of Congo's religious culture, I believe, has relevance also for us in the United States, because if, as we have seen, interviews conducted in South Carolina and Georgia reveal that African Americans, they are still used some Kikongo terms in the 1930s. This evidence of the long lasting influence of cultural elements from the Congo region renders, I think, legitimacy to the plea not to ignore Africa's long Catholic history when studying the development of African American Christianity. We may therefore conclude with a reference to the British geographer Richard Burton and his report from the 1860s on a visit to the town of Pinda in the western part of the ancient Congo Kingdom. When entering an old Catholic church, this British geographer saw a statue of the Virgin and of saints, he saw crucifixes, he saw a baptismal font, and in spite of seeing all of this, Burton wrote in his diary, and I quote, all traces of Catholicism in Congo have disappeared. Interestingly for us, however, he did notice one more object of particular importance to that local community. And that object was a church bell. It was a church bell dated 1700, and it wore the inscription, si Deus con nobis quis contra nos, if God is with us, who can be against us? If God is with us, who can be against us? Thank you all for attending my presentation. Wow, thank you. Thank you, dear friend. What a wonderful, beautiful presentation. And I think it is normal, really, to start with those who have been engaging with Congo studies for such a long time. I know John Tortor will ask, just uh, start with you, your questions, uh, comments. We've got it two Johns here, and uh, I know that Professor Rasmak is there, and uh, so just our uh, dear sister friend, uh, then uh, Stuart uh, is there as well. Just why not to start with uh, Tata Janzen, and then we'll go to just uh, John Thornton and uh, John Janzen. Do you have any comment before we or question? No, I will <clears throat> defer to other people who have studied this history uh, very carefully. Um, I can only report that in the in the depths of the North Congo Manianga region, uh, the phrase Congo Diangunga uh, was alive and well. So interesting. Um, <laughs> Thank you, John. Yeah, yeah, it's it's there and uh, a very potent symbol. But otherwise, I will defer to other people. John yeah. Totten. Very fine uh, presentation. John. Thank you. Thank you. John, John Totten. Yeah, thanks. I could probably talk for the rest of the day. It's <laughs> 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 near here and dear to me. Um, just one thing that, that just struck me while, we, while, we were, while you were talking is um, that the Kingdom of Congo was unusual with regards to the larger spread of Christianity in that it was not colonized at any point during this period. And then it took an extraordinarily important independent rule in bringing Christianity to its own country. Uh -huh. um, we tend to think of the spread of Christianity as European missionaries sort of going out and, and locating people and contacting them. But in fact, it was the other way around. In, in, in 1484, Calacamfusa was already brought to Portugal. He stayed there for a year. When he reported back to um, Banzo Congo after having stayed a year in Portugal, learning Portuguese, obviously, and becoming familiar with Christianity, he clearly advised his king that they should take Christianity up as well. Because when, when Zhuang Zingangku, when, to become Zhuang Zingangku, 
um, when he sent his 1486 mission to Lisbon, um, he instructed them precisely to learn reading and writing, to study Christianity, and to learn other factors of European culture that were of interest to them. It was like a study mission. They stayed there for nearly four years. Um, and so it's no surprise that when they came back, boom, everything fell into place. If you read Huy de Pina's account, it's like, it's like clockwork. Everything's there, but it's ready, boom, boom, off they go. Um, and then of course, as you pointed out, really important point, the Portuguese never did send a lot of priests anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and indeed, when, when Alfonso was begging him to send priests, they just didn't do it. So Congo developed its own church and those schoolmasters, Mestres de Scolo and Don Galeki, um, these were the people that really created the Christianity that developed in Congo. Um, again, in their own roots, in their own place, uh, without having a dominant factor. The per clergy, they come, and you really see this with the Capuchin clergy. What did they do? They did the sacraments, the sacraments and the sacraments. They didn't do a great deal of preaching. Of course, they did preach and they did some teaching, but they would never have reached all the people. But you saw people who, in the course of a seven-year mission, would have baptized 50,000 people. Um, and that's what the clergy was for, um, especially because they there were very few the Africans who became clergy and had the opportunity to do that. So I think that this is what what, first of all, really entrenched Christianity in Congo in a way that it wouldn't have happened had it been a colonial setting. There wasn't that kind of resistance from it. And it really did thoroughly Africanize what came out of it. Um, I just have to tell the story that when the when Europeans drew maps of, of the world in say 1450, they believed that the Garden of Eden or the terrestrial paradise existed mm -hmm. at the source of the Nile River. Um, when they plotted that on a map, in say 1510, they put it pretty much in the center of Africa. And as soon as the Portuguese voyages reached uh, Central Africa, they put the Congo River on that map and had it flowing out of the terrestrial paradise. Um, and it's interesting that um, uh, Alvaro I, the King of Congo, was well aware of this. And he pointed out to a visiting missionary that obviously humanity had originated in the, in, in the center of Africa and that the fig tree, which uh, the Adam and Eve covered themselves in the fall was in Safi, um, which is you know a local fig in Central Africa. And so the Congolese had already sort of adapted the idea that <laughs> humanity began in Africa. And what I think is interesting about this story is uh, we think, well, you know, that's a little crazy and then map makers were all wrong. But, you know, DNA has taught us that, in fact, humanity did originate there. If there is an art, a, a garden, it's <laughs> great there. So that's my, that's my commentary. And that's so much a question. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you, Tata John. Yes, uh, yes, Russ Michael, just have studied those issues as well. Russ, any comments or question, please? Sure, I, I, I have a, a comment and then a question. One is I, I really appreciate the inclusion of the videos. Um, I, I, it just it gives a nice sense for some of the, 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 the sound and performative nature of, of what you're talking about. And then also I was thinking, especially with the first video is with where drums are very prominent, mm -hmm. um, is that it also indicates some kind of the musicological elements that we could look at and some of the material culture of ritual and ceremony, which is just, which is very fascinating. And I think something that I would be interested in seeing many of us historians get more into as well. Um, the one, the question I had is about say more kind of ongoing connections or interactions between confraternities and initiation societies, um, just as, in, it may be instead of, or in addition to thinking of either or, it's just kind of like, what do we see as kind of the interactive elements, like on a cultural scale? You know, where are these kinds of things where, where um, like in a Congolese context, but also then, you know, whether it's Cabo Verde or, or in Brazil or wherever, where you're having these ongoing interactions between, um, uh, what we'd be much more comfortable saying is, is kind of African-based and then Catholic-based, you know, that ongoing thing, where, where, where are we drawing lines? Where are we seeing maybe mutual influences, that kind of thing? Yeah, it's a very good, thank you, Russ. Excellent question, but very difficult to answer 
very difficult to answer. And, and you use the expression drawing lines, right? And, and precisely drawing lines is just so, so difficult to do uh, in, 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 these, uh, in, in these circumstances. Um, it depended, of course, on, on, on the, the composition of the population, right? Um, if you have a population that, that um, originated, so to speak, from the heartland of the Congo region, for instance, and they're the vast majority of the population, then I think the type of, of, of uh, mutual aid societies, secret societies, initiation societies, call them as you want, they, they, they will have a very different characteristic than when you have a society where initially perhaps uh, the majority was originating from the, from, from the heartland of the Congo society, but then quickly people from other parts of Africa came to that same region and then became the majority, right? Um, and then established societies that potentially built on the earlier societies that had been established already by the charter generation, then, then you will see these societies having very different characteristics over time, right? Um, so it's a very um, complex story, um, but, it's, but again, um, um, essentially, my message is um, let's not let's not forget about this history, right? And, and and whenever we speak about initiation societies, secret societies, let's take into consideration that that there is this old history of of Christianity of Catholicism in Africa, um, and and let's include that in our reflection on these societies. Um, 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 I'm, I'm thinking here of the case of, of Haiti, right? Uh, Haiti uh, voodoo, for instance, right? Where, where all uh, Catholic elements traditionally were, 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 were explained with reference to, to French colonialism, right? The French were the ones who had brought these Catholic elements to Haiti. And, and my point is then essentially, um, sure, but, but let's also not forget about, you know, earlier um, uh, influences um, 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 whereby um, enslaved Africans themselves, um, right, uh, from the Congo region and elsewhere, brought um, um, Africanized forms of Catholicism with them to a place like Haiti, uh, and then the impact uh, this had on on the development of voodoo and and of initiation societies and 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 phenomena such as uh, Rara, uh, for instance, in in Haiti, etc. Well, thanks for that. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. most definitely it is the, the Congolese context and then the Congo diaspora where you will see that. I think I, I'm following along with that too, where yeah. Yeah. that most intensive interaction is is ongoing and having big influences. So yeah. it's good to do the highlights, like you say, that's very important. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Yeah. Thank you. Just, uh, dear Sister Diane, Professor Seward, any question? Any? Yes. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I'm so sorry I'm not visible. They made me interim department chair, and I've been in meetings until late, late, late. So I got a late start this morning. I'm holding, <laughs> I'm holding your book, Jerome, Afro-Atlantic Catholics. I'm holding it. I ordered it last week. Some of you might know that the project that I'm working on right now, it really it materialized um, since my first conversations in the field with revival Zionists in Jamaica, who were telling me that our ancestors brought this tradition to Jamaica from Africa. And I was thinking, that's not true. We know it's not true. It started in the 1860s. What are you talking about? But the more I, I, I delved into historical research, you know, I was theologically trained, but the more I delved into historical research, I realized how true it was. Um, and Congo, um, Congo's um, experience with Catholicism has a lot to do with that. So I really appreciate this, this book. Um, I, you know, I tell the, re the religious historians in my field, if you all would do the work beyond Protestant Christianity, it would help others of us who, who want to do, do the conceptual work as theologically trained folks. Um, so, you know, I've had to rely on historians like Jason Young and Ross Michael Brown, and now your work um, to help. And so I'm, I really do appreciate appreciate um, this kind of research and really pushing the boundaries of what we've considered in the past. I do think that um, 
one of the, the problems, and Al Rabatou has been incredibly definitive for my for religion and theological scholars, is also it's also language and focus. I mean, many of these um Anglophone scholars really do not branch out and do not deal with Francophone and Lusophone material. And it's it's really sad. Part of it is the way we we train in terms of region. Um uh, we don't do the transatlantic work that we want to do. And I tell my students all the time, the people who are making the impact in African Atlantic religious studies are not religion scholars. And we really need to ask ourselves why. But kind of building on Ross Michael Brown's um, question, what, what, one of the things what I'm thinking about and wondering about, you know, as I said, I think conceptually about these things. I think about interiority. Um, that's what theologians do. I, I, I think about um, um, what I would call kind of Africana sacred poetics, how how myths and symbols and and um, even constructed histories um, emerge from the Black uh, religious imagination. And so one of the things I'm, I'm thinking about is how, um, how these African elements show up in the Catholicism. In other words, um, you know, what do we know about how Congo cosmologies, uh -huh. symbols, um, epistemology, just orientation to the sacred, how is that showing up and interacting with these Catholic elements? Um, can we? Can you say a little bit more about that? I know about your other works, and I know you went deeply into um, more, you know, Congo indigenous uh -huh. traditions there. I would love to kind of push that because what I think Ross Michael is asking for, we're we're almost still in either this kind of defensive position of showing this is Catholic, this is Catholic. And I think what he's asking for is that it's kind of we're the Congo people who claim an, a, a Catholic um, identity, mm -hmm. which we must understand very differently than the way mm -hmm. Christian studies understands that. Mm -hmm. It's like they're mm -hmm. Catholic, they're not something else. That's not mm -hmm. how these enslaved captives and liberated Congo captives understood themselves. Mm -hmm. I, I use that word on purpose, liberated Congo mm -hmm. captives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not how they understood themselves. They understood themselves as people who were deeply in touch with their languages, their cultures, their spiritual orientations, who, for those, and for those who claim to be Catholic, they came to be Catholic, but it wasn't, therefore I'm not something else, right? Mm -hmm. So what, what I'm trying to understand is how, what is essentially African Catholic about these phenomena that we're seeing? What is essentially Congo Catholic? How, how does Congo show up in these Catholic um, iterations of faith, of spirituality, of political power? I, I, I would love to hear more mm -hmm. about that, because I think you're right. People kind of draw these camps. It's like, I'm going to show that this is just Congo, Congo, Congo. I'm going to show that this is just Catholic, Catholic, Catholic. How do we, how do we understand, you know, what was nurturing their sacred poetics in terms of those, uh, what it meant to be Congo and to be positioned in the world, um, in, in strange new worlds in many cases, in, in this way. Uh, you know, I just, I, I would love to hear you say a little bit more about that. And just in terms of the church bells, I think, that, you know, this is incredibly fascinating um, because, you know, the revival Zionists and particularly the spiritual Baptists, I mean, they ring bells like crazy. They ring bells all the time. I mean, they have all kinds of ways of, 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 um, um, explaining how when they ring their bells in threes to represent the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, but the bell ringing is extravagant, and so that I, I think that connection could be really a very interesting one that you're making. And then um, I wanted to also say it's so strange that I had never made the connection between gumbe and cow, and the gumbe drums and the gumbe ceremonies in Jamaica because. You know, we know that that gumbe drum is the square drum that they use um, often, you know, it's connected with junk canoe and uh, traditions and also the gumbe um, drumming um, ceremonies. 
But I wonder if it's because they might have been made out of cow skin. I'm just, you know, I just had never, um, you know, I had never made that connection. But anyway, I just wanted to, to say that. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Diane. So many questions and, and so many interesting uh, ideas you presented. And I also wanted to say how much I, I benefited from the important article uh, you published on, on um, was it Trinidad, I think. Oh, um, thank you, yes. And the Shango and Arisha cults and, and how they um, built, right, on, on earlier foundations. Um, yes established by, by Afro-Atlantic Catholics. And, and, um, and, and in a certain way, your, your article was, 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 was um, instrumental uh, for me in, to, to um, uh, rethink um, um, also um, 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 these types of societies, right? Um, whereby um, you don't draw a clear line then um, to, um, to a certain region in Africa, but, but you also raised the question, was there perhaps an earlier African foundation on which these societies built? Um, and so that was definitely a very interesting uh, paper uh, for me. Um, men mentioning myths, um, you know, um, it, difficult questions to answer again. Um, um, I, I, I have a, an, an article where I try to do that um, uh, with a focus on, on salt, um, the use of, of salt in, in, in Congolese uh, uh, baptismal practices um, and where I associate the importance of salt um, to, um, as you know, Diane, uh, these, these stories we find all over the Caribbean and also in North America uh, about uh, flying Africans, right? Yes. Flying Africans who are able to fly back to Africa, um, but who cannot do that as soon as they ate salt, right? And then I raised the question, could this eating salt perhaps be a reference to, to um, a baptismal uh, ritual? Um, and could um, eating salt actually be understood as, as having become Christianized? Um, and, and that those, once they became Christianized, no longer uh, want to fly back to Africa. Instead, they want to fly to heaven. Right? And that's, that's, that's just one example of where I try to look at, at mythology. Um, but you do raise other very important questions and, and you know, I've been looking for answers myself and, um, and, and one, one, one thought that time and again comes to mind um, um, is, is, you know, how important was, was the spiritual element here and how important was, was the mutual aid, right, uh, the solidarity among these people. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, I'm sure that both were important, um, um, but it's 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 crucial for us also to see right the the, the circumstances in which um, these people hold on to these societies, and, and they do so, of course, in, in the context of, of of a slave society, mm -hmm. where the only people you you can trust are your own people. Right? There's nobody else there to, you can trust. There's nobody else there who can help you. There's nobody else who, who will show solidarity. So the only ones you have is, is people of your own community. And I think that's also part um, to understand why these mutual aid societies became so important. Right? And um, so the social dimension um, is, is very important um, um, as well. Um, perhaps even more important than the spiritual dimension. I don't know. Um, um, so definitely, um, this is important for us to take into consideration. Uh, what I would also highlight, uh, Diane, is um, um, indeed um, you, you mentioned, and rightly so, that that um, the, the form of Catholicism we, we see in in the Congo region and we see in in, in the diaspora is 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 very different um, from from European uh, Catholicism, from Portuguese Catholicism, like that. Um, but um, what I came to realize in my research is, is that there are um, also similarities uh, between um, the way um, Congolese people ended up embracing Catholicism and the way people in the Cape Verde Islands did that and the mm -hmm. way people in Saint Tome did that. Mm -hmm. um, and when you look at a place like Manhattan, right, 17th century Manhattan, um, where you have an enslaved community essentially composed of people 
originating from parts of Africa with a historically strong Portuguese influence. And then very quickly you see how they built uh, uh, really a, a, a unity and, and how there's marriages between them. Right? Very early on, we see a marriage between, for instance, uh, an, an, an African female from the Cape Verde Islands and, and an African man from, from Congo, right? They get married. Um, and, and then, you know, the question I raise, right? How, how much does a shared awareness here of, of Afro-Iberian um, cultural elements, religious elements, how, how much of a role did that play in bringing these people together? Um, because as you said, right, they, they, they arrive in the Americas, it's a very hostile society, a very different society, and it's only natural, I think, that, that uh, in such a, such a situation, you look for what is familiar, right? And what was familiar, of course, was, was, was the African heritage. What was familiar was that they all went through this terrible journey that, that, that forced them out of Africa, took them on the ship all the way to the Americas. But perhaps there's also a third element that we need to take into consideration with this potential familiarity with some Afro-Iberian cultural um, elements, potentially even language. Uh, so I looked into the case of, of, of Manhattan and, and, I, and I think we can make a case there. Um, that the earliest um, language that allowed Africans from different parts of Africa to communicate among themselves um, was, was not English, it was not Dutch, it was not French, but it was, it was an, an Afro-Portuguese pidgin. Um, and, and that's also, I think, an important element here, especially when it comes to, to language. Yes. Um, Can I have a quick follow-up? Sure, sure. Just, just a point of... of, of clarification about uh -huh. historical detail. When you mm -hmm. made um, reference to the pre-Council of Trent traditions and uh -huh. people, what, uh -huh. and you talked about the establishment of black confraternities uh -huh. in Portugal in the late 1500s. Uh -huh. um, Earlier, in the 1400s, okay, and uh -huh. made those connections. Um, but then later on, you, you talk about this being something very common in Portugal, um, medieval Portugal. Uh -huh. Are you talking about Portugal society overall, but, or were you talking about Black Portuguese society? I just want to be sure oh. I understand. And the dancing and uh -huh. all of those kind of traditions, would uh -huh. that have been kind of accepted and known yeah. among Euro Portugal? Uh -huh. uh, very, very much so. Yeah. Okay. Very much so. Um, I just want to be um, sure. Uh, you look at, at 14th century sources, uh, 15th century sources from Portugal, and you see how common it was yeah. that people would, would dance in processions, people would dance in the church. Uh, there were certain saints in Portugal where it was even um, 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 considered um, uh, your duty um, to dance, uh, and you would do so in church in front of the altar. Right. Do scholars believe that that's an African influence mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. European? Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. and 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 of course the dances then that we see in these in these black uh, confraternities are mm -hmm. obviously African dances. But, mm -hmm. but the point is that that okay. dancing was common. Okay, right? also among Portuguese. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Sure. That was sure. fabulous. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. I have a contribution. Yes. A question. Okay, go ahead, John. Tata John. So. Um, the first video you showed uh -huh. uh, reminded me of the uh, great importance here of the uh, <clears throat> physical aesthetic, shall we say, uh, the sensibility of, of um, what we would, let's call it music, but it's much wi wider, than, <clears throat> much, much more inclusive than that. And, and I think one of the... Um, one of the features that's central and <clears throat> needs to be taken into account here in the in the spread of a common uh, uh, religious culture was um, <clears throat> the very widespread elements of of uh, song song and dance as in the first video it begins with a leader uh, calling uh, a, a phrase out once or twice, and then the uh, congregants or the participants then respond in a in a phrase that either matches or or is is a counterpoint, and then and then 
at some point um, the the percussion enters in, whether it's just a tapping of something or shaking of a rattle or something more uh, powerful like a drum, then then enters in. And then you get, um, of course, the physical movement, the, the, the dancing. And th this, this package of, um, shall we say, expression um, is very widespread in, in Central Africa. And, and uh, it seems to me that the confraternities assumed that this, this is how they would, they would um, meet and, and, and process or represent their, their newly found or shared, shared uh, faith. And this was also the aesthetic package that the European priests could not control because um, how, how do you intervene in that whole thing? And an additional feature of it is, is that um, it is very social because this music is a conversation. It is not just performance. It is, it is a conversation, a living performance. And then another dimension of it that I suppose one could study, and I have basically realized it through my work on uh, Ngoma, um, is that it is polyrhythmic potentially and polyrhythmic um, f begins to um, enable a hidden beat that is not necessarily predictive of trance but it certainly is easier to think of the spirits when you have a hidden beat uh, that is beneath the uh, the conversation of rhythms. So this whole, I see this um, this Catholicism, uh, Afro-Atlantic Catholicism, as simply one more expression of this powerful um, uh, Central African aesthetic that that it was difficult to forbid. I mean, uh -huh. it was it was the medium in which resistance was possible. And, and so I just like to make that point and the, the, the videos and the historical texts are powerful documents that, that I'm glad you found in an archive. So anyway, uh, bravo and uh, interesting. Yeah, thank you, John. And and maybe maybe what I would would add is is um, so, so you 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 use the word conversation in characterizing um, what we saw in the first video, and I think rightly so. Um, one could also characterize it in addition as as a pantomime, as a form of theater, because um, essentially what they do is they tell a story, yeah? and and the story they tell is 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 the story of of a statue of Our Lady of the Rosary um, that arrived at the shores um, and first uh, white people wanted to, um, to, to take the statue to their chapel and they were unable to do so. Uh, the, the, the statue would not move away from its place. Um, and they made several attempts and time and again they failed until finally a group of, of black uh, people would come and they would approach the statue with their music and their drums and, and their songs. And, and they were able to, to, to take the statue with them and willingly the statue then accompanied them to their chapel. That's essentially the story and they tell. Thank you. Professor Sally, just uh, if you have comments or question, please. Huh? Yes, um, thank you very much, Professor De Wood. Did I say the name yes, right? Yes. And um, I'm not uh, in anthropology or religious studies. I'm a linguist uh, mm -hmm. working on uh, the emergence of Creoles. And I found a whole lot in your presentation that resonates with issues we've been wrestling with in um, accounts of the emergence of Creoles. And I'd like to start with a linguistic comment, the list of Congo words in Gala. Uh, they are written in what we call I dialect. So in order for you to pronounce them well, you have to speak English and not 
read that as if, as if they were written in right. African mm -hmm. uh, uh, transcription. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they will actually highlight more similarities to the Congo than mm -hmm. you may expect. Interesting. Um, the other thing that I found particularly uh, informative in your uh, presentation is what um, uh, study students of evolution call the founder effect. That what may have started on a small scale in Africa has come a long way through the history of the people and even amplified in some cases. And one of the reasons for that, which is also quite evident from your presentation, is the introduction of Catholicism with a sparsity of priests mm -hmm. in the Congo. Mm -hmm. Few priests, but they managed to first influence the Congo monarchy into Christianity. And they actually, if I remember well, even formed a seminary or seminaries to mm -hmm. form indigenous priests. Mm -hmm. And so part of the explanation that we get here is, please excuse my telephone. Mm -hmm. Part of what we find here is a process of indigenization of religion, where you have foreign elements absorbed in a majority population not in a situation of tabula rasa, but where things are integrated in traditional beliefs. It's a new religion, but it is indigenized and therefore absorbs a lot of uh, mm. traditions into the new religion. So it's no longer really just a European thing. Mm. It's an Africanized thing. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. like as Christianity itself, Catholicism itself was uh, impregnated with pagan elements in Europe <laughs> and became the form exactly. of Christianity that was brought to Africa. And in Africa, in a, a situation where there were few priests, but a lot of new converts there was a lot of room for indigenization. And that is actually part of what we come to know as syncretism. Mm -hmm. Because syncretism is the blend of what you adopt with what you already have, and you create a new hybridized uh, phenomena. And that is very interesting. One, a couple of things struck me on uh, some of my visits to Brazil. In one case, I was fortunate enough to be invited to a candomblé ceremony. And when I was there, the only person that was dressed in African style was the religious leader. The Orisha was dressed in the Portuguese tradition, the medieval or colonial and a lot of the participants, they were dressed either as Portuguese monarchy, or in some cases, I was reminded of the attire of the Roman soldiers during the ceremony. Uh, but then there were a lot of incantations that sounded so African and so forth. And you see again, evidence of this syncretism here. Uh, so, and in this particular context, is candomblé by any chance a continuation of Christianity? Mm -hmm. I asked mm -hmm. this question to a colleague of mine from Haiti about Voodoo, and his answer was, we don't distinguish Catholicism, Catholicism in the church with spirituality mm -hmm. at home. And when you put it, put it like that, Vodun is also a continuation of Catholicism as it is a syncretized mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Another thing that struck me was a visit to the Museum of uh, African Art, I think it is in Sao Paulo. And one particular representation struck me is the representation of the Black uh, Virgin Mary, 
-hmm. So at first sight, you say, wait, my, my God, you know, they chose an African representation of the Virgin Mary. And then you look at the statue, it's a life-size statue. The Virgin Mary has blue eyes, a white nose, thin lips, and the hair is not funky. And so, <laughs> you know, it's a, this appropriation of this, let me call it white religion, mm -hmm. with and, and integrated in a black world, but still maintaining a lot of those Caucasian features. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and in all this, what I see is not really what is particularly African and what is particularly European, but I'm reminded of something we call congruence in studies of creoles. And congruence is where, as you showed in the case of dance, there are practices, indigenous practices or non-European practices that are similar to European practices. And in those cases, those particular traits are amplified in the syncretic uh, uh, creations. That, that is really something that struck me. And that will also address the question that Diane brought up about Kumina in Jamaica. Uh, when you pay attention to uh, things in Kumina, you find a lot of this long list of African, uh, Kikongo words for that matter. Uh, it takes a lot of, a little bit of uh, philology to really <laughs> identify them and make sense of them. And you are right, a lot of these things have been memorized because if you ask people to explain to you what they are reciting, they are incapable of doing mm -hmm. that. It takes mm -hmm. an outsider to come and make sense of mm -hmm. uh, those kinds of things that are uh, recited. Uh, and uh, so I, I'm really grateful for this presentation because it's, you know, it shows to what extent both in religion and in language we struggle to make sense of these obviously not simply European retentions, <laughs> but a blend of European elements with non-European elements into something that we could very well also claim to be Congo if it is the people from the Congo who brought those practices to the new world and they are not necessarily in situ creations in the new world out of nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. And, and I can't agree more, right, with, with, uh, with the, the syncretic element uh, you highlight here and, and the parallels we see between the development of language and the development of, of religion. Um, just one thought that came to my mind and that I would love at one day to explore with, with, with linguists like you is, is the potential importance here of confraternities when it comes to the evolution of language. Because uh, if you think of a confraternity, it's a place where people gather and spend many hours reciting prayers, right? And I can imagine that for newcomers from Africa um, who then join the confraternity, that these, that these confraternities may have been a form of, of schools, even in the sense that this is the place where you adopt the pronunciation, where, where you uh, adopt uh, new words, uh, and that perhaps these confraternities had also a major influence on, on the evolution of, of, of Creole languages. I don't know, but yes. it's perhaps something to, to think about. You are mm -hmm. thinking right, because a lot of these retentions have taken place in communities that are more or less secluded from the majority. Mm -hmm. And that is the significance of Kumina, for instance. And one of the explanations that we as, as, as linguists have uh, explored is that in the case of Jamaica, the Bakongo came after the abolition of slavery. And mm -hmm. they, they didn't immediately blend in the Creole population. And so they had a lot of opportunities to retain a lot of the, the practices from Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of Gala, which you also mentioned on the coast of South Carolina, there's the issue of what Lorenzo Turner called basket names. 
African names that have been retained, but have been used not in the public sphere, but in the private sphere. And you make more sense of these names if you read them again the English way. <laughs> and then you will find to what extent African names have, but some in some cases been distorted. But if you pay attention, they are really African names. And the names were meant to be transparent and meaningful, but don't, people don't remember the meanings of those names anymore, mm -hmm. so forth. And mm -hmm. if you look at food, uh, in, in uh, uh, culinary traditions, the cuisine among the people that remain kind of small communities, and which is also the case of the maroon societies that you mentioned. That's where you're going to find more similarities between the way these the, uh, people of, of African descent in the New World cook and the way people cook in Africa. Mm -hmm. But when you go, so there's a different forensic uh, between cuisine in the African American uh, among African Americans in the mainland and cuisine among African Americans like the Gala people on the coast. Mm -hmm. They don't cook things exactly the same way. And you find more retention from Africa on the coast than in the mainland. But that's part of the story. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've got two more questions and then we'll be done. Um, uh, we've got to, yes, thank you very much. This is very interesting. Well, I know that people would have to be- Adrian, can I just interrupt and make a quick comment? Okay, go ahead. Um, I think, you know, I just want to say to Professor Mufwene and, and the whole group that I, yes, I found that um, in Congo, um, I think a lot of Jamaicans would be surprised to know that they, um, the Kumina people still cook differently. They have, and I think one of the reasons uh -huh. is that the rituals with the offerings for the ancestors required them to retain certain culinary traditions to please the ancestors. Because we see the same thing in Western Jamaica with the Yoruba descendants, um, the people who practice Etu. Um, they cook differently. They uh, Their whole Etu tradition is, is based around ancestral offerings. So I, I agree with that. And when I showed up in the first Congo community, they greeted me like this, Malembe Kento. That's how they greet it. <laughs> and quite frankly, Jamaicans have a way of saying, take it easy, man. And that means take it easy. <laughs> and I almost wonder if they're saying in their Jamaican Kikongo, the, the thing that we tend to say in Jamaica, take it easy. That's a very, it, I bet you that even grew out of the slave experience, but take it easy. We do that all the time. We greet people that way. We, we leave people that way. So anyway, I just wanted to add to that. Thank you so much for those comments. Mm -hmm. And that, then I would want to say that that uh, expression is so popular among the Ngunza, where just the Manyanga, Mm -hmm. where John Johnson and the Ward Magathy and the Tata Celestine was in London, just uh, have done the work. So whenever they meet, they just, they say to themselves, Malembe men or Malembe. And right. respond, well, maybe, Malembe. maybe that's how we got yeah. take it easy. Maybe that's how yes. we, you know, cool mm -hmm. it down. That's, you know, we have a way of using the word cool. I actually want to write a whole article on the aesthetic and principle of coolness which has been so important in African-American, especially masculine culture and Jamaican culture. So, And, and I think that John, John, John Johnson and, uh, and, uh, and uh, just a friend, uh, Yolanda, very much acquainted with those expressions given the time that they have spent in that region of Manyanga, mm -hmm. where just the common greeting is not really mbote, kambote, but they say malembe. Mm. And, well, and, and that's very, very important. Yes, we've got uh, Bruno, and then we have uh, Fred. I think that'll be it. Bruno from Brazil. That was your question, my friend, or comment. Hi, everyone. I would like to thank you, Jury, for the mm -hmm. speech. I, and, and it was really nice to, to, to hear about the, 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 the research and it, how it resonates with the work with Marina here in Brazil mm -hmm. and other scholars mm -hmm. here then it's, it's quite important here for us, right? The first I would like to, to give a propaganda and especially for, for Ras, Michel, I think you like, there is this just brand new documentary that was uh, just released, I think two years ago. I don't know if you know it, Joe, uh, 
Jiren. It's, a, it's a, a colleague of mine. She's anthropology and she took two king, one, one, one king and one queen of Congo to mm -hmm. Banza Congo and uh, make these connections and talkings and how they play the music together. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very nice. And I will give advice for Adrian that maybe we can invite her to show the, the documentary here to everyone see and to uh -huh. talk. It's a very uh -huh. nice uh -huh. uh, documentary. Uh, I don't know which is available. I, I don't know, but I, I watch it. It's just amazing. And the other, the other is a question, Jerry. I think uh -huh. I'm, I am archaeologist and I work with more material things of the, the legacy of the material heritage in the Banza Congo and it was my research. And I really have a problem with this, this strong connection of Catholicism and, and in Congo, because my, my research, that's, I, I, start, I take the, the time in the 19th century, right? Mm -hmm. So when we read the British, the, the British missionaries, the Baptist missionaries, like this is the, the, the Catholic presence in Banza Congo, it's completely over or really, mm -hmm. really few. This is a point for me, but more than this, when we look for the Conf Berlin Conference in the, the, the 1970s and 18, 1870s, Portuguese were really eager to find reasons to why Banza Congo and the Congo Kingdom should be a Portuguese possessions. And in hundreds of books of Luciano Cordeiro and the, the, the Lisbon Geograph Geographical Society, there is no mention at all I, when, when I've read it about this continuity not even as much, uh, not even similar to the ones that we find in Brazil or in Jamaica or Haiti or in the US. So it's it's complete mess my my mind. Why, how can like this, this too much strong Catholicism in the 18th century and the 19th century, even people that really are looking for this, this manifestations to justify the colonization, the, their presence there in the territory, they don't. They don't. They, they, they don't talk with it. Barroso, the Bishop Barroso, the Bishop uh -huh. Barroso went to Banza Congo, and he don't say enough this about this. He don't say that they are primitive and that this thing. We 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 can't understand about this this eager to 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 civilize to civilize. And we, we I, I'm sure that the question the answer is he, he, there is no way, but it's, it's too much. Like I've read. I don't know if you read that there is a, a journal. A, a, a newspaper called Missão de Angola in Congo. It's a newspaper that starts in 1910, and it's go away all the colonization period. And I've read almost all of them, and there's not even mention at all about these communities or Catholic permanence in Banza Congo in the Congo area. And we, we see they mention ruins. That's what my research did. They mention ruins of church. They mention their presence in mines or in roads and everything. But these communities know. So how could you explain that so, so, so big contradiction about the 19th and 20th century in Africa and Brazil? Uh -huh. There is and there no nothing. What, uh -huh. How can this be? This yeah. Is the question. Yeah, it's a very interesting, very difficult, and very, very important question, of course, Bruno. I must say, first of all, this is not really my research, right? My, my focus is, is how uh, it developed in Africa and then came to the Americas and continued to evolve in the Americas. What happened um, later on in, in Africa is not so much my focus, but, but you make an interesting point, right? How, how is it possible that, that, that we have all these references to the importance of, of Catholicism in the Congo region in the 17th century. And then we look at it in the 19th century and it seems like hardly any king has, has remained. So what happened, right? Um, I don't have a, have, a, have a clear answer for you, but what I, what I can say, Bruno, is that you, know, you live in Brazil and, and you know how quickly things can change, right? When, when, when we think of Brazil only a few decades ago, it was seen as, 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 as um, um, a country where um, you know, Catholicism was 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 undisputedly uh, the strongest religion by far, and 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 who could imagine right, that a few decades later, all of a sudden, we see these these Pentecostal churches developing, and how quickly you know religious uh, faith can can change in a certain geographical area. Right, it's a few generations, and you have something completely different. Right. Um, in addition, um, we also do know, Bruno, that when when Baptist uh, missionaries right, go to 
uh, the Congo region and, and, and they have their first mission um, in Banza Congo. Um, you do find references there um, to people um, coming to the church with a certain knowledge of Christianity. Um, so apparently, at least at that time, right, there was still in the region, at least among some people, uh, an awareness of, 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 of Christianity. It's not that that when these Baptist missionaries arrived, there was, there was nothing, right? Um, um, a possible explanation for this, Bruno, that, that, that um, the sources you looked at don't mention anything is potentially that, that those who were looking for traces of Christianity were looking at it from a, from a contemporary perspective, right? They were looking at, at Catholicism the way they understood Catholicism as, as 19th or 20th century Portuguese. They were not looking at traces from a 15th century perspective, right? And had they done that, then maybe they would have found certain characteristics um, that, that could potentially be traced back to this earlier history. That's what comes to mind. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm sure there's much more to be said, uh, but again, it's not really my, my area of focus. It's, it's too bad that John uh, Thornton, who, um, he certainly could, could say more um, to this question, but, but I, I appreciate your question. I think it's a very important uh, question for us to think about, but thanks so much for the link. I, I didn't know uh, about the project and, and um, I will, I will look at it with, with a lot of, a lot of interest and, and it would be wonderful if one day we could, we could bring a Congada uh, all the way to North America. Uh, I think here too, people would be fascinated and very interested in learning more about, about these, these performances and dances. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. I just, I think to the last question we read, in fact, speaking about uh, Marina, just Professor Marina de Souza is one of ours. Oh, yeah. I just uh, I just communicated with her today, mm -hmm. and she just said she couldn't make it today, and uh, she'd be watching the video as usual. Yeah. Because she sent her greetings and love. Thank you. A good friend. Uh, yeah. Okay, Fred, please. Fred, yes. Super quickly. Thank you, mm -hmm. Jerome. Right. I had right. no idea. I have an amateur interest in history. Had no idea you were going to bring up confraternities. Mm -hmm. That came out of nowhere. Because the Catholic Church, if, if you have traditionalists in the Catholic Church, they all go back to Trent. That's where they mm -hmm. stop. Mm -hmm. But before Trent, there was all kinds of, it was a lot more enculturated. And so there was an openness in Catholicism to local expression. Um, and so, for example, this is from um, Augustine Thompson's book um, about the Italian communes. Um, which also talks a lot about confraternities and their practices. And this is during Easter when they would dance in the church and all kinds of stuff. So there's yeah. a fascinating mm -hmm. yep. prehistory of Catholicism that has been totally forgotten and oh. paved over. Mm -hmm. And, and um, not to, um, I'm not, defense, I'm not defended, trying to be defensive on the Catholic side. I don't care where the line is. We're all mixed up. Everything's combined. Everything happens, right? It all happens. Um, but the one thing that we forgot is that Catholicism used to be super different than it is right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's all I want to say. Thank you so much. I'm yeah. going to buy your book. It's a lot of money, but I'll buy it. <laughs> Sorry, Fred. <laughs> it's not my fault. But thank you so much, Fred. I can't agree more. I can't agree more. Thank, thank you. you. I think we have to end there. Thank you very much, friends, for coming. And uh, Jerome, okay. thank you very much for your talk. We have enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And this is your platform, this is your home. You, you are one of ours. And uh, thank you and congratulations to your book. And myself, I'm looking forward much. to giving a copy.